Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you guys for joining us today. My name is Alex Puba, and this is Sam Sathiawan. And to my left is Megan Kuhn, and then all the way over there is Morgan So. And we are going to be talking about our proposal for the Florida East Coast Railway. And this is our agenda this evening. And so first, this is just a very brief outline. We'll just move right in without taking up too much time. I'll go over the issue on the next slide. And the issue is, should Florida East Coast Railway implement a route to the mid-Florida area, particularly to Orlando, in order to get transloading opportunities and to meet that excess capacity. And a little background on the company is that we are a class two railroad company who, which connects with other class one railroads such as CSX and NS. And our culture is very innovative. We have an innovative reputation. We have made bold pursuits in the past and these have come off of calculated decisions that have worked out in our favor because we are we pursue these, but we do make these tough good decisions and make sure they're right for our company. And the bulk of our business is intermodal transportation, and that accounts for approximately 76% of our business. And of that, a lot of that is based on imports coming from the Caribbean, from Asia, and from Europe. And so from now, I'd like to introduce Sam, who will be talking about our routes. Well, thank you, Alex. So we laid out what the challenge is um, as, suppose, as relates to whether or not we should move forward with this project to connect the southern part of Florida with the central part of Florida. Um, and we, as a team, felt you know, really good about recommending that we should move forward with this project you know, to build the line and to be able to take into account some of the different opportunities that are going to be able to present um, itself you know, through the series of steps that we're going to talk about. You know, Megan and Morgan are going to talk about it. But before we do that, you know, I would like to take a step back and kind of look at the bigger picture. Um, you know, the different current shipping options are the five different options that you can do. You know, say if you're a manufacturer of goods, you know, from the Far East, you want to ship something to the U.S., you know, you can go through L.A., you can go through Long Beach, you can go through Houston, you can go through Savannah, you can go through, you know, Jacksonville, Miami, so on and so forth. You know, you have that decision of whether or not you want to do, you know, motor care, you want to do intermodal, you can do rail. And, you know, all of that different options sometimes can get convoluted. So we took the liberties of you know, making that a, a visualization for you um, in the next slide. So here we can see you know, the ship coming from Far East, China, going down to the Panama Canal, you know, going through the canal, um, and then sort of moving over Haiti and Puerto Rico before going to Jacksonville. And then from Jacksonville, you know, through motor carrier, and through the highway, through the final destination, which is Orlando, Florida. So I'll now turn it over to uh, Morgan for why we chose to do that. Sam? <clears throat> so the Jacksonville item that uh, Sam had talked about was strictly, and our first lens was just on cost. So we went through on each of the different ports, what was the original port cost, any additional um, rail charge, any additional um, gas fees or gas surplus charge, and those are the numbers you would see here. Um, throughout the different ways that you could get to Orlando, there were some variants, but overall, Jackson was the best option. But from here, um, after making the visualization, we took a step back and said, these shippers aren't just worried about cost. We had to take a holistic view, which is in this next slide, and we broke it down into four areas, um, decision criteria that shippers along any port trying to get almost anywhere around the world, but being narrow-minded towards Orlando, this is some of the things that we considered. So first was cost. Um, it, might, it wasn't the most important, but it was considered because if costs were too high, they couldn't ship with us and then in turn be profitable. Next, I want to dive into social responsibility. So carbon emissions, um, we want in general as a society to reduce our carbon footprint, but also to share value through our, our supply chain, down to our suppliers and back up so they can share it to their suppliers and customers. So we took that holistic view and we considered that people shipping on our railways or anywhere in the United States would have thought the same. The next two decision criteria are interrelated but are still important. So next is risk. So if things would get stuck in a port due to labor strikes or if there wasn't enough capacity on our railways, that was considered within this risk category. And lastly, service. So what sort of service are we able to provide to our customers? We as in a shipper. Um, so this service could be quantified in days of service or week time provided on different sort of routes. So these in general, based on an addition or a holistic view from cost, 
we'd evaluate as a shipper based on these four um, criteria. So from this, how do we quantify this or how do we evaluate these four items based on our five modes? And we created a weighted scorecard approach where we didn't weight cost number one. So cost was number two, still important, but we considered risk avoidance a mode that could avoid risk to be almost the most important. Then moving down, service is still important, what we're able to provide to our end customer, as well as corporate responsibility. Even though right now, based on uh, the snapshot that we took of these five modes, um, corporate responsibility was the lowest, we can see in the future that corporate responsibility is going to be an even bigger um, aspect looking forward. So some of these items that might not have gotten rated so high might be into consideration going forward. So instead of um, walking through each one of the modes, I wanted to talk about kind of our lows and our highs. So intermodal through Southern California, as I had mentioned while going through the decision criteria, um, we rated it a one in risk avoidance due to some things happening in the East Coast, things getting caught up, as well as being able to travel on I-95 and that capacity constraint, we considered that not being able to avoid risk, seeing that let's say I was a shipper wanting to go through those southern ports of California, I might not have the capacity going forward or the options to ship that quantity through that area. Um, another one to highlight here is um, the, the service going all the way across, that's reflexive of the lead time respective. So overall, that was a 2.3 on our scale. And I now want to move over to Jacksonville, which was the most optimal of the five um, different um, routes that you could have taken. So Jacksonville was four in risk avoidance based on a couple of things. So the first was um, the proximity. So there wasn't as many uh, touches when going through Jacksonville just to get to Orlando, just based on proximity, things that can happen, traffic jams, and some things along that nature. Cost based on the slide two previous, um, it was the lowest, so in nature, we gave it the best score, as well as corporate responsibility. This was one that stood out to us with the potential um, to reduce our carbon footprint. But now um, that these are the current options, I want to pass it over to Megan, and she's going to talk about some of the future options um, we've projected. Thank you, Morgan. So, <clears throat> Going into the two future options that we have, the first one is a direct shipment. This means that it would be through different block shipments, either coming from the Port of Miami or the ICTF out of Fort Lauderdale. And that's where the range comes in with the cost, is there are different costs associated with the transportation from each one of those facilities. So that's where that variation comes in. But as far as the route, it comes from the Port of Miami or the ICTF, and it goes up to Cocoa Beach through <clears throat> rail, and then there it is um, through a highway chassis over to Orlando. The main drawback with this type of route is that on the way back, the container is empty, and that, <clears throat> deadhead, trans that deadhead transportation is definitely a huge drawback from this option. So here's a cost breakdown of the route and how we got to that initial total cost value. So bring in the freight, <clears throat> freight cost into the port of Miami, and then transfer, transferring that, the blocks to Cocoa Beach with those variations in cost that I mentioned previously, and then the highway transportation, and then in red is the return route and how it gets back to the port of Miami to return those international containers. So here is option two, which involves transloading. This, uh, this route, <clears throat> include the movement right here from the Port of Miami immediately to the Hialeah facility, which is where the international containers will be emptied and put into the domestic containers, and then the international containers are then shipped right back to the port to be repositioned for exports or anything else that they could be used for at that point. And then they go up to Cocoa Beach to <coughs> Orlando, and then actually on the way back, to reduce or to further the utilization of those containers, they actually go to Cocoa Beach and then up to Jacksonville Port so that they can pick up material so that they aren't, they don't have that deadhead transportation on the way back and they can be refilled quicker in that sense. So here's the cost breakdown of this. Again, the same freight cost from before. 
and then the shuttle cost to the Hialeah facility. And then there is a transfer fee associated with the domestic to international transformation or transfer of the container. And then to Cocoa Beach to the final destination. And then here shows where <clears throat> it will go to Cocoa Beach and then up to Jacksonville to be re refilled and ship some So we applied these criteria to what Morgan had previously talked about into the weighted scorecard. Here we compared the most optimal for the five current locations, and then we took into account both option one and option two. So as far as risk avoidance, they scored the same because of the intermodal aspect of it, that it, because there are different forms of transportation, if something were to happen to the truck or something, we could implement the rail and then um, mitigate that risk a little bit. As far as cost, option two was a little bit more expensive, but it scored a little bit better because of the utilization of those containers, and we factored in that extra profitable revenue that comes from that, we factored that into the cost aspect of it. And then as far as service, they both scored average because it's not necessarily saving them a lot of time, so we didn't think that that was as important, but just the intermodal aspect of it and the utilization is more important. And then the corporate responsibility, just <clears throat> using the transloading and getting the better utilization of those containers definitely came into play with this. So now, I'm going to pass it on to Sam to talk about how profitable this could be for our company and if we should move forward. All right, well, thank you, Megan. So I know we threw a lot of numbers at you guys, and so, you know, let's review a little bit. Um, we talked about what the challenge was, you know, who we are. Um, you know, kind of what the current options, the five different options that we can do as far as, you know, shipping from Far East to the U.S. and what are the, the two proposed, um, you know, future options that we do move forward with this project. And, you know, looking at it not just through the perspective of cost, but taking that holistic view like um, Morgan shared with you all and, you know, taking into a different account of different things that what the consumer would think is important for them. And based on this, um, you know, all this different, uh, aspect criteria, um, we want to back it up with numbers because at the end of the day, you know, if something does not make a good, you know, sense business case wise, you know, it wouldn't go move forward. That's, you know, that's the most important thing. And so some of the numbers, you know, based on the um, 2014 average revenue per container, as far as the dollars, 15% profit margin, um, that's our assumption. And then there's the 160,000 TEU, you know, container number, um, that we can potentially, you know, siphon off from ports in the West Coast or um, the port of Savannah and, and maybe even a little bit more from, you know, Port of Houston, taking all that into account and also, you know, viewing the cost of the $5 million needed to upgrade the Cocoa Beach facility, um, you know, the extra, um, you know, trailers needed to, to haul off the, um, the containers on the highway, some of the incremental cost of, you know, labor, um, risk, insurance, um, and last but not least, also some of the marketing initiative that we would be doing, you know, we do move forward so we can take it to, um, we can, you know, draw more, um, you know, shippers so they can, you know, go through with our route as opposed to moving to a different port. So taking all this into account, um, we went online and, you know, found out um, from the DOT what are some of the um, average ROI um, of the different, or of the seven class one railroads. And you know, the, and we calculated the industry average based on the dollar amount, um, and you know, which is 12 and a half percent, if I'm not mistaken, with the highest being UP almost 15 percent. You know, based on the assumptions that we make, um, you know, the cash flow, the cost, um, you know, our ROI for this particular project um, came out to be about 27 percent, which is almost double um, what the highest one, um, which is from UP. And we felt like, you know, based on the different criteria and based on this number to back it up, we felt very strongly that this is. You know, a, a good business case that we can bring forward to, you know, the board of directors or the, the, the executives, so they can approve this project and move forward and to be the better company, um, given where we are and we want where we want to be. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alex for the summary. So to summarize, we do want to pursue, pursue option two if, with the transloading to Central Florida, in particular Orlando. And we want to do that because of the opportunity to draw some of the volume from the East Coast in particular, and possibly some from Southern Atlantic, and even maybe a little from Houston. But our main target will definitely be the West Coast, because that's where the most of the volume is coming in. 
and that's where we find the opportunity that we can divert some of that with the economies of scale moving through the Panama Canal in the coming years. And so when we did our route analysis, we did find that Jacksonville is the most cost-effective route, but after further analysis and looking into what the shippers' needs are going to be, we found that it may not be the most ideal route to actually take. So that's why we find that there's an opportunity to you do this transloading opportunity to actually go to Orlando from either Asia or the Caribbean import, uh, importing countries. And the benefit of doing this is because we actually have only 75% of our northbound units uh, loaded at any given time. So when we're heading northbound up uh, the east coast of Florida, only 75 or only 25 percent of that is actually being utilized. So there's a lot of opportunity for incremental revenues just by filling that capacity that we already have. So there's a great potential for extra revenue stream just to come in from that. And from the shippers perspective, yes, cost is definitely key and we are competitive on cost doing the transloading. So that's ideal. We need to be at least competitive to be in the even mindset of these shippers from across the country. And, but along with that, not only the cost, but we also have the service. Since we are a smaller railroad company, we are a class two, all the communication between us and the shippers are going through us. So instead of going from NS to CSX, whatever that route may be, through different intermediaries, we are going to be the ones who can communicate with the shippers and solve the problems and any problems that do arise. But going along with that, we do have a reduced risk because we are on the East Coast with the current labor relations on the West Coast and uh, just all the turmoil and congestion on the West Coast, it's the ideal time to implement such an opportunity because this is the ideal time to actually get involved because people are reevaluating their supply chains and this is just an opportunity for us to move forward and be able to take some of that volume. And going along, along with that profit, uh, profitability, going off of our net present value, that is dependent upon obtaining 50% of the 160,000 TEUs that are currently going from California to Florida. And those, those TEUs are entering from the, the West Coast and Southern Atlantic, uh, Southern Atlantic ports. And if we can obtain just 50% of that, that's where the basis comes for our ROI calculations with a net present value of 10 years. And we find this just a substantial opportunity, even if we can't get 50%, which we think is a very realistic number because of the current relations on the West Coast and because of the expansion of uh, the Panama Canal that is going to happen. So we will be able to give economies of scale to those shippers. We think it's just in bringing everything together, it's just an opportune time to expand past what has been traditionally going on and as a company move forward with another innovative practice that has been another calculated risk, but it's something that we find that is a great potential even if we, if we can potentially get more than that with the Miami actually expanding in the coming years and those eastern ports. There's great opportunity and the more shippers we can get on board early and the more we can transition from the west coast to the east coast earlier while these current relations are going on, we find this a better opportunity to do so. So with that, we'd like to open it up for any questions. Great, great presentation, great graphics. The, um, your assumption with the 50% is probably impossible. But assuming, did you make any assumptions if you couldn't do that? What, what's it going to do to your that? Where, where are the thresholds where you say, we got to hit this or we're losing money? Right, we're, we're at about 30% where we can still make money and be profitable and actually hit that 10%, it's all, or the 12.5% industry average. And that, that's our discount rate that we're going off of. We want to at least hit that. So at, I think it was approximately 30, 30 some percent, I don't remember the exact calculation, but that's when we hit a net present value of zero. So we would need to obtain that. On your, on your ROI slide, is that we're not taking into account capital expenditures it would take and what what were you specifics of that. So yeah, thank you for that question. So we, we put this on the appendix side. And I'm not as knowledgeable as you are on the 50 percent. We just sort of assume the under 60,000 number, uh, that TEU number is from you know the case study and we thought, you know, if that volume is coming through, you know, to Florida from the West Coast, if we do move forward with this and 
you know, given the cost competitiveness of where we are and the, some of the other um, service qualities, we thought you know 50% was a, a safe amount, but I guess that's not what it is. Um, so what we did was we took that 50% um, of 160,000 TUs, converted to um, you know the 40 footers, then converted to the 53 footers, um, and then based on the $450 um, average, um, you know, per container of revenue that we get, um, and then you know project it for the next 10 years and then discount it back 12.5% um, based on the average ROI of the you know, seven class one railroad companies. Um, you know, we got positive NV, NVV for, of almost you know, four million dollars, and that's it. That's about um, I think 20. That's where the 27% number comes from. So that's that's how we sort of uh, did our, our calculation there. Funny, was that based on you know the the cost? Yes, we build up yep, the, the five million and then the hundred thousand dollars upgrade and the hundred twenty thousand. How many tractors did you do? Okay, there we go. I told him to miss the sign. We, <laughs> no, that's okay. We hear a lot of numbers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't see how many tractors though. No, we yeah we we assume that you know the five million, the hundred thousand, the hundred twenty thousand, and the marketing and all the different costs. We assume that the total cost to do it is about six million dollars. So. It's, it might be a little, you know, too low, but that's what the, what is, that's the assumption that we made for but the I cost. That you included your marketing expenses in that, though. So, right, the marketing will have to yeah. go to the shippers and logistics companies to actually move sure. the freight over to these coasts. Yeah, that's an important part of the startup. So, how did you guys incorporate the fuel surcharge aspect in your analysis? Mm -hmm. So the fuel surcharge was based on, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, we, we did this based on the initial um, amount of miles traveled divided by um, the miles per gallon, multiplied that by a standard rate um, that we found in the United States and it was about $2.75 and then we amplified that up um, based on um, the different carriers. But I do believe that we were at the 20% discount and we factored that in um, to our future calculations of our next two options that would, we would be able to provide, but you wouldn't see that 20% discount here um, in the five presented. Did yeah, I so all the fuel surcharge are built in there, and when, what Megan was talking about is we basically took the numbers from the case study, we divided that by 5.8, 5 which is the, um, I think it's according to the Service Transportation Board, the average miles per gallon of a truck um, in the U.S. Multiply that by, you know, last Monday's average diesel price per gallon in the U.S. from the EIA, um, and then the, that, you know, find out what the um, fuel surcharge is, which is 24%, and then just build all of them in into this, you know. Okay, so all the numbers we're looking at are all apples to apples, and they all have fuel in them. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. So if you see there, the truck on Jacksonville is 5,400. That was the lowest, and Savannah's second lowest at 5,586, and Miami's at 5,711. So if you flip forward to your option, Translate option, which you're recommending. You're at 5770. So that says that this new service is actually more expensive than the way people are getting the freight to market today. So now you're a shipper. Why are you going to spend the extra two or three hundred dollars? I can grab this one. So this is where. Um, we took into that scorecard approach where we took in the different um, holistic supply chain views. So technically you're right, they are paying that $200 more, but to the shipper, um, what is $200 for? Is that worth another day of service? Is that worth maybe some better communication with your shipper? So that's where we factored in the four different areas that I talked about. So cost, yes, that our option might not be the um, the cost leader, but we're definitely cost competitive um, compared to all the other options. And then that's where the other 200, you could consider value added based on the other three area, criteria areas. And adding on to what Morgan said, the future opportunities of the economies of scale increasing from 5,000 TEUs to up to 13,000 TEUs is an enormous opportunity for all the shippers going through the Panama Canal. So that's something we're looking to pursue with all of our shippers is to make them aware that this is in process. In the future, this is an opportunity that is going to absolutely reduce economies of scale. Okay, but wouldn't that, wouldn't that apply to all of the East Coast ports equally? Right, but 
in the majority is from the West Coast, and that's the, where we're looking okay, to so cycle the supply okay, product. So we're looking to divert that from the West Coast. Your goal is to divert the West Coast. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. What, uh, what total volume are you looking at converting with this? We are looking at the volume that was from the West Coast. It was 160,000 TEUs, and there was some from the Southern Atlantic Coast as well. And that is a minuscule amount. I think we calculated about 1.7% of their total volume. And so we're looking at actually just taking a very small percentage because in proportion, Florida very, gets very little imports in relation to the 40% of the total U.S. imports that the West Coast gets. And, and then they're going through the transload facility. Exactly. And so how many loads would you actually be putting on the FPC? That's a good question. <laughs> that would have to be a very good question. That would have to be based off a number of assumptions. Uh, off the top of my head, I would have to calculate the number of containers that each train can actually take up at a given time. And then I would also have to factor in the number of tractors that we have pulling into Orlando as well. But off my current information, I cannot give you a specific answer. Uh, can you go to the the morning of matrices. Just either one, doesn't matter. That one. Fine. This one. So, uh, I think this is what they call baseball scoring. I mean, higher is better. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, are we done now? So I was going to give you a piece of advice. If you do this, you can do this by weight, which you've done, um, and then you multiply the score times the weight, right? If you want to get a little more nuanced about it, you can force yourself to score either a 1, 3, or a 9. Uh, and that's a Six Sigma approach. It just okay. forces to either be low, middle, or high. And it's a technique to increase differentiation um, that you might want to think about. It's called the CMEA matrix. You can Google it. Okay. But I, I personally think this is a very compelling way of trying to differentiate. Um, so I like it. I'm just giving you a piece of advice. Absolutely. I wasn't aware of that. That's called a CNA. No, that's, that's good. You would have seen an even greater spread. It would have accelerated. Yeah, it right. forces right. you to, um, you know this, Parker, because you did the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, anyway, no, I, I found this is, and I think you answered um, Adrian's question right, because, I mean, the bottom line is you're $200 half. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to go over Jackson. And so you have to compel it with <laughs> other reasons. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that was your point. I have one other just note on your presentation. Mm -hmm. When you when you when you have the opportunity to make this kind of presentation to a customer or to a board, you're not wasting your time and you don't want to you don't want to say that right from the get go. And I'm not saying that personally, but I'm saying that for the whole presentation. It's your three minutes of fame or five minutes or twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. You gotta be spot on. You come in there and you tell them what they need to know and you're not wasting their time and you are you are the star. So, and, and you've got to just know your information. If you know your information, just like you've answered the questions, that's perfect. But don't go in the front gate saying, we're just going to, we're going to hurry up. Okay, yeah. Okay, just that say, right. you just Absolutely. come in the gate and you say, hey, I'm here and, and here's my, here's the solution that's going to do what you need to do. Okay, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And time. Okay, great job. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.